Is that not enough as a miracle? The book itself, Allah says, is a miracle. And a miracle indeed it is. A miracle, in the first instance, we Muslims, we believe that this book is Allah's kalam. Allah Baritala revealed it to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The enemies of Islam, they agree that this is the book that Muhammad left. Friends and foe alike, they say, this is the book that Muhammad left. But they say that this is not Allah's kalam. This is Muhammad's cleverness. Very clever man. So we say, look, he was an ummi, an unlearned person. He said, yes, but wasn't he a very clever man? Wasn't he a great speaker? Wasn't he a great thinker? Ah, we would have to agree that he was. He was exceptionally good in all these qualities. Then he said, look, why could he not have rehashed into a beautiful language what he heard from his environment and dished it off as revelation? It's his handiwork. Allah testifies against that. He says, Wa ma anil hawa. He says, He does not speak from his own desire. In huwa illa wahnu yuha. It is no less than an inspiration sent down to him. Allamahu shadidul kuwa. He is taught by one mighty in power. We believe that this is Allah's kalam. Allah testifies and we testify. But the outsider, he says, No, this is Muhammad's handiwork. So I am telling you, my brothers and sisters, let us for a moment agree with the skeptic, with the cynic, with the critic. Let's agree with him and admit that this is Muhammad's book, that he is the author, though we know he is not. So he said, all right, so you say this is Muhammad's production. He says, yes. So now I want you to agree with me that this is a one-man job, one-man effort. If he did it, this is Muhammad's own handiwork. So well, there's no hesitation in accepting that, that this is his handiwork. I said, right. In that case, I said, now I present to you this book in its material magnitude, in its size. This is one man job. You have here another job, which you claim to be Allah's Kalam, the Bible. This Bible consists of the Old Testament, which is actually the book of the Jews, and the New Testament, old and new put together, the Christians have inherited it. Old and new put together. In this encyclopedia called the Bible, there are 66 books inside. What we might call surahs, in the Quran we have 114 surahs, they have 66 books, big and small. But these 66 books are authored by 40 different persons. This is what they tell us. 40 different people, their writings lying around, manuscript form, whatever form, that they got them together into one book. 40 different people wrote, went together to produce this one book. This is a one-man production, if at all. <laughs> Out of those 40 different authors of the Bible, the greatest writer, the most voluminous writer, of all is a person called Saint Paul, the real founder of Christianity, Saint Paul. This Saint Paul wrote more than 50% of the books of the New Testament. There are 27 books in the New Testament. Out of the 27, Paul wrote 14, more than 50%. But those 14 books put together they don't consist more than this, what I'm showing you now, not more than this. Fourteen put together. The greatest writer, the most learned writer, that's fourteen books. This is one man job. On the physical magnitude of it, we say it's a miracle. And this book, the Quran, is not talking anything, everything, filling up, is a filler. No, no, no. It's a very, very concentrated stuff guiding mankind into all aspects of life, solving all his problems for eternity till Yawm Al-Qiyamah.
So, Allah says, is this not enough for you? That this book we have given to this man and ummi. Then the contents of the book. You see, in this book, the Quran, some of these things I'm demonstrating to you. The subject is so vast, wallah, it, take, it will take a number of talks to deal with the whole subject. And I do not want to hold you people up here till midnight or till early morning. I can. Just on this subject alone, I can keep you all here till one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. But I do not think it's fair or just to you or to me to do such a thing. So I will have to curtail a lot of things because I, as a layman, I can give you a dozen different miracles in the Quran. The learned man, perhaps he can give you a hundred miraculous nature of the Quran. I myself, as a layman, I can give you a dozen, which we will not be able to touch tonight. But I give you a few. Number one, the concept of Allah bari ta'ala. You see, we know Allah by his attributes. And Allah gives us his attributes in his book. We do not have to create these attributes. We have not to concoct them as to what Allah is. So he tells us what he is. He is Ar-Rahman. He is Ar-Rahim. He is Al-Malik. He is Al-Quddus. He is Al-Salam. He is Al-Mu'min. He is Al-Muhaymin. He is Al-Aziz. He is Al-Jabbar. He is Al-Mutakabbir. And on and on and on. He gives us, Allah gives us in his book, 99 beautiful attributes. Like a necklace of pearls. 99 attributes with a crowning glory, Allah. A big pendant, Allah. Proper noun, Allah. 99 attributes and one proper name, Allah. Makes it at 100. And I'm asking learned people, doctors, lawyers, philosophers. When I meet them, I say, look, tell me now. I would like to know from you. How many attributes can you imagine that you can attribute to God? How many? Come, try, try. So he says, well, he's the father in heaven. I say, yes. He's, God is love. I say, yes. No, no, tell us, whatever. Come on. He's just. I say, yes. He's holy. I say, yes. He's merciful. I say, yes. Come on, come on, come on. You know the cleverest of us. The cleverest of mankind, the most learned of us, he can't go beyond a dozen. He can't imagine with all his learning more than a dozen attributes from his knowledge. He can't. I said, you see, this Ummi, if he did this work, he gives you 99. He said, well, you see, Muhammad was a genius. And a genius can do 10 times better than us. He admits, he's a genius. Still, it is not Allah's kalam. A genius can do ten times better than what I can. I concede that I take off my hat to Muhammad. He is great, but he is no prophet. He is not a man sent by God. I said, all right, all right, but now look. In the names that you mentioned, in the first six, the first one was the Father in heaven. But let's say, in a number of tries, in the first half a dozen, you can't help using the word father. They say, Abbana, O oh, our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, O oh, our father, the loving father in heaven. The first half a dozen, you must come out with the word father. He said, yes, anybody, if you try, the father is there, is dangling before everybody because the Christians have made it famous. The Jews were calling him the father in heaven and the Christians call him the father in heaven. The commonest, this word, father. I said, you know what? In the list of 99, this word father is not there. That is a miracle. See, the miracle is that the thing that is being dangled before him for 23 years, people are talking about the Father in heaven, the Father in heaven, easiest to take. He doesn't take it. He doesn't catch it. Either consciously or unconsciously. We know it's not his word. It's Allah bari ta'ala. He's making him not to use the word Abba. In Arabic, it's easier than Rabb. 
He's Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. He's the Lord, cherisher, sustainer of the world. He's Rabb, Rabb, Rabb. And Rabb is harder than Ab in Hebrew as well as in Arabic. It's a beautiful expression. The Father in heaven is a beautiful expression. Why wouldn't Muhammad have it? Uh, why wouldn't Allah allow it? You know why? Because this word, this name, this attribute, beautiful attribute, has been abused. It's a beautiful attribute. Words have a tendency to change the meanings. Good words, beautiful words, innocent words. Like the word comrade. You see, this word comrade is like sahab, my friend, my companion. Companion means, in French, person who break bread together, that we eat together, he is my companion. Companis, panis means bread. When we break bread together, we are like one brotherhood. Beautiful word. Companion, comrade, beautiful. But you know in the United States, if you address me as comrade Didat, you know the, the, the CIA or the FBI will have me checked up. Straight away they'll take me away, you know, to find out what are my philosophies, what am I preaching about, do you know that? I hope. You don't use such a word on me. Look, the word is beautiful. Look at the dictionary. Dictionary meaning is innocent. Good. But it has other associations in people's mind. Comrade associates you with communism. So we eschew it. We won't use it. There are other words. Like gay. G-A-Y. Gay. Beautiful word. See, when I was going to school, when I was a young boy, I was teaching us poetry, poetry, English poetry. I still remember, I'm 70 years and four days old now. I still remember, it says, gentle lords and ladies gay, on the mountain dawns the day. Gentle lords and ladies gay, on the mountain dawns the day, beautiful word. You know, happy and gay. Says so happy and gay. He's a jovial person. Ladies, gentlemen, and men, men and women, all. We say, oh, they are very, very happy people. Happy and gay. Jolly people. Jovial people. Beautiful word. But it has acquired other connotations now. As I was growing up, I'm reading the newspapers, and I read this word gay in there, and it creates some fishy smell. And I don't know what they're talking about. Gay. Gay is not the gay that I learned at school. You know, something fishy about it. I didn't catch it for a long time. I couldn't catch it. You know, whenever the word gay occurred in the newspapers, I couldn't catch such a beautiful word. What is this? What they're talking about? It smells. But what the smell is about, because I was using it, gay. I would say I'm happy and gay. Today, if you say that our chairman is happy and gay, you know, you'll only shoot me. <laughs> You see, innocent word, beautiful word, but has, it has acquired other connotations. Allah tells us in the Quran, so, A verse, the Jews were using this word, Raina, innocent word. It's a look at us, pay attention to us. But they had other meanings attached to it at the back of the mind, as if you're gone off the track. So Allah says, don't use words of ambiguous, ambiguous import. See, you're using the word Raina, but at the back of your mind, you're trying to say something else. So you are gone in the, their own language to say that you are drifting off, you know, you're gone off the track. He says, don't talk like that. Say, unzurna. Don't use words like that. Similarly, words, they change their meaning. The Father in heaven is a beautiful word. But now it has other connotations. In Christendom, they tell us that Jesus is the only begotten Son. Begotten, not made. This is in their catechism. The Roman Catholics, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Methodists, they're all in their, in their catechism. The religious principles that they expound in the churches teach their children. They say, 
that Jesus is the only begotten son. Begotten, not made. Don't make a mistake. It's not like Adam. Uh, like I said, very interesting. Um, I love his last few points that we've watched here of how one word can mean something to me, but it means another thing to you. Like gay, gay is just means happy. But nowadays, if you look at the society, the world we're living in, it means something else. People are even as afraid to say, you know what, I'm gay. Happy, by the way, I mean happy in this sense. Otherwise, um, he was touching point on why the Quran is a miracle. And I'd, I'd love for the people watching this to please remind me of why the Quran is called... Um, referred to as a miracle and another thing is he mentioned the bible has 66 books what about the other books that have actually been thrown away had those not been taken out of the bible how many chapters would have been in the bible let me know what you think if there's something that you want me to react to drop the um the link in the comment section below and i'll see you in my next video